Thank you, Karen. Yeah, so um, the title of my talk is There Back Again, an analysis of the movement of avian specimens through time and space. And um, this analysis is part of my master's thesis research. Next, please. Okay, so the data that I used for this analysis, I downloaded from VertNet, which is an online database that aggregates biodiversity records from natural history collections. So in particular, I was interested in avian or bird specimens. Um, these are used for research. You can see at the bottom of this slide, the types of preparations that I counted as a bird specimen for the sake of this analysis. The initial data set was about six and a half million records, but I subsetted according to two different criteria. The first is records that had at least country level georeferencing. So by that, I mean the record had at least a country indicating where the specimen was collected. And that was about three million records. And the second subset were records that had more precise georeferencing, so they had a Latin long. That might have been GPS data, or it might have been retroactively applied georeferencing. And that was about two and a half million records. Um, next, please. And this is just a quick map showing the locations of the natural history collections that um, I'm using their data. Um, keep in mind through the analyses that there's obviously a spatial bias towards North America, um, in particular the United States. And then Europe, unfortunately, VertNet had no specimen records that I could use for the sake of this analysis that came from institutions in Asia or Africa. I have a few in Australia and two in South America, which are both in Brazil. Next, please. So the questions I'm hoping to answer are looking at how movement patterns of specimens have changed through time. And in particular, has the distance from location where the specimen was collected to um, the the institution that is storing the specimen has that distance changed through time in a recognizable or interpretable pattern. So the analyses were applied to both the country level and the precise georeference data, but with slightly different approaches due to the constraints of the data. So for the country level data, the bulk of the work was actually cleaning and standardizing that country field. There's a lot of getting rid of bracketing or typos, um, accounting for historical place names. And to do that, I used the natural earth map subunits data which includes countries and sovereignties, as well as constituencies, dependencies, um, disputed territories, and non-contiguous land units. I took that approach recognizing that using just the country level introduces a wide margin of error in georeferencing, so I was trying to get the best data possible. After that, I filtered the records to um, specimen records that had at least a year indicating when the specimen was collected, and then limited that to 1800 to the present. Having cleaned all that data in R, I ran it in ArcGIS Pro using the tool Generate Near Table. But rather than running it on each specimen record, which would have been a big computational burden, I limited it to just each unique origin destination pair, where the origin was the centroid of the country where the specimen was collected, and the destination was the precise lat long of the natural history collection that is currently storing it. So the output of that would be the distance in kilometer from collection to storage and I joined that back to each row of the data. I couldn't take that more efficient approach with the georeference data though, or the precise georeference data since each um, location of collection was a unique location. So instead I just filtered it again with the same um, date criteria. And then I ran a different tool in ArcGIS Pro called Generate Origin Destination Links on each individual pair. So that was, I ran that tool on about two and a half million um, rows of data. So that took a really long time. And the output was, again, distance in kilometer. Next, please. And this output is from the origin destination links tool. It's kind of a lot to look at, but I tried to make it as interpretable as possible with the amount of data that's being displayed. The white dots are each specimen and the location where it was collected. And the yellow, pink, purple, and green dots are the locations of the natural history collections that we looked at in the previous map. The lines correspond to the continent of the institution that is housing the specimen. So the line connects the specimen from where it was collected to where it is now stored. This map would suggest that the United States does a vastly more collecting than any other um, country or continent, which might be true, but again, that this data doesn't necessarily indicate that because I just have more data from the United States. But we can see that the range of collecting in North America and Europe is far wider than the range from the institutions in Brazil or Australia. Next slide, please. So that map looked at um, collecting by the continent where they're being stored. This graph looks at collecting by the continent where the specimens were collected. So this is um, each bar is a year and the height of the bar is the total number of specimens collected that year. So it can get a sense of when collecting occurred 
Um, there's a lot of collecting happening in the 1930s and 40s. That big dip before 1950, I think, correlates to World War II. And that's part of my ongoing research is looking at whether we can map um, geopolitical events to specimen collecting activity. Um, next slide, please. And this is that same data, but it's now scaled to proportions of each year. So each bar, you can see in that year what proportion of the specimens collected were from each continent, which gives us kind of a good overview of where collecting was happening through time. Um, next slide, please. So I had to kind of hurry through these. <laughs> so these are the results from the distance analyses. This is the country level analysis. Each line is the continent of the holding institution, like the map that I showed a few slides before. So um, don't have a lot of time to dive into this, but you can see that the line for Oceania is much shorter. So the distance from where the specimen was collected to where it's being stored is a lot shorter than, for instance, North American institutions. And next slide. This is the same analysis, but for the precise georeferencing data. So the main point of these two graphs is that there's a big difference in the results from the country centroid data versus the georeferencing data. So that did introduce a wide margin of error, like I said. Um, next slide. And then finally, I ran a linear mixed effect model on both of these sets of data to try to piece out what might be contributing to that distance, the difference in the collecting distance. So the models at the top here, we're looking at year, latitude, and that was absolute value. So that um, translates to distance from the equator in either direction. The size of the institution that's holding the institution, the annual total number of specimens across institutions that were collected the year that the specimen was collected, and the country, as well as a random effect for the institution. So um, I was happy to see that the country level data and georeference data had basically the same results, which are that annual total was not significant for either, but year latitude and institution size were. So these are the p-values. So um, next slide, please. These are not the greatest looking graphs, but I wanted to understand that significant relationship. So the one on the left is distance to institution size. So basically the distance from collection to storage increased with institution size and same is true for year, which is interesting. And then next slide. But latitude um, is in the opposite direction. So basically with increasing latitude, distance decreased, which suggests that specimens closer to the equator tend to travel further from where they're collected to where they're stored than um, specimens further from the equator, which bears out with kind of the theory behind um, colonial science or parachute science uh, with scientists from the West, or I'm sorry, from the global North dropping into areas like the equator to collect specimens and take them back to their institutions in the global North. Okay, that's the last slide I had. Thank you so much for listening and I'm happy to answer questions when we get to that part. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Summer. Yes, uh, if anybody has questions, toss them in the Q&A and we'll take a look at them in a little bit. Um, our next presenter is Abi Munyu Hans, a data services graduate assistant at the, at the and Data Services Lab at McKeldin Library, University of Maryland. He provides UMD patrons with data science related consultations, teaches work stops, and engages in data analysis projects. He is a graduate student at the Clark School of Engineering. Uh, before beginning graduate school, he worked in industry as a data scientist for five years and holds his bachelor's degree in mathematics. He is presenting Analyzing Seasonal Crime Trends in Chicago, Examining the Impact of Temperature and Geography on Public Safety. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I'm Avioni Hans, as uh, thanks Karen for introducing me. Uh, and yeah, uh, so my my talk is titled as uh, Analyzing Seasonal Crime Trends in Chicago. Uh, this has been a joint work uh, uh, with uh, lots of nice people at the University of Maryland at GS Data Center and at the uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, namely, it's uh, me, uh, Alice Benjamin, and uh, Milan Bhutatoki from UMD, and Ashish Sharma from the University of Illinois. Uh, next. Yeah, uh, so the overall uh, scientific goal of uh, this uh, project that uh, we are still uh, like uh, on our way uh, to take our next iteration is to analyze and identify seasonal patterns of crimes uh, and as well as uh, understand uh, is there any, uh, you know, uh, uh, crime is a like uh, 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 
locality sensitive uh, uh, crime is a locality sensitive and if temperature is an indicator of that and uh, the uh, ultimate uh, uh, like uh, contributions uh, will be for this project is to uh, like uh, people at public policy to drive a policy such that uh, uh, you know you uh, inculcate all possible predictors of crimes uh, uh, such that you uh, ab uh, are able to uh, tackle it better uh, next yeah uh, so uh, in this uh, for uh, to understand the effects uh, if uh, crime and uh, temperature go hand in hand uh, we take city of chicago as a prime uh, city uh, for several reason it's a metropolitan city which is known for its high crime and diverse uh, unfortunately diverse uh, 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 categories of crime and uh, uh, because of this uh, overall high high crime rate and especially it it, uh, uh, it is ranked as a uh, high uh, number of violent crimes uh, in uh, when compared to uh, the average of us cities uh, it is ranked as eighth uh, we take this uh, city as uh, our uh, first uh, uh, sample really uh, to, uh, for our analysis we uh, take uh, 20 years worth of data uh, uh uh from 2000 till 2020 to uh, uh ascertain like if uh, uh whatever we are trying to uh, uh the uh, uh the relationship between temperature and crime does really exist and how how far does it really uh, gets us in predicting crimes next uh yeah uh so on this slide uh we have uh, the total number of crimes that is happening from uh, uh 2020 till uh, uh these are monthly crimes uh till 2020 uh from 2000 till 2020 and we look at three types of uh, categories of crime uh namely uh the property crime uh violent crimes and non-indexed uh these uh, uh categories of crime are derived from the uh, logic that fbi uses so most of the violent crimes go into the violent uh, violent category property crime go into uh, property crime category uh the uh, all the remaining types of crime are uh, called non-indexed uh, by that same definition and we follow the same uh, definitions for our analysis uh, so most of the crimes do fall into the non-index as we can see it is the uh, largest number of uh, it's, a, it's a crime that is uh, most frequent among the three categories so uh, can we click on next yeah so what we see here that uh, you know the uh, local maximas that we see here uh, 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 on all three sets of uh, categories of crime happens uh, to be in the months that are uh, summer months uh, where temperature is relatively high and this uh, maxima is of number of crimes is almost sustained for few, uh, like one or two months before it falls down and uh, we do see the uh, correlation of uh, temperature and number of crimes that happen uh, which is kind of invariant of the category of crime we are talking about uh next uh similarly we see the valleys uh just like peaks in the summer months we also see the valleys which are very sharp valleys if you see in winter months so the crime uh drastically drops down uh in the uh, like uh, uh chicago is also known for its brutal winter so it drastically falls down in the winter time and it uh, uh, again picks up uh, very very fast so these valleys are very sharp as we see uh next uh, so uh, this uh, uh, this is a seasonal change in average crime uh, uh, rate by type. Uh, what we see here, uh, what we want to ascertain is what is the type of uh, type of crime that uh, uh, changes the most when we go on an average changes the most when we go from non summer months to summer months. So on the the uh, type of crimes that are on the left side of this graph are uh, uh, do see the most increase are most dependent on temperature. They uh, on an average they increase by uh, 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 the type of crime homicide, sex offense, and battery on an average increase by 31, 30, and 24 percent respectively. And on the right extreme of this uh, plot uh, are the uh, type of crimes that are like least uh, dependent on temperature. Uh, next. Yeah, uh, uh, in the similar notion, we have a, a count of, uh, this is a, on the left where we have a radial plot, which uh, uh, tells us the total number of crimes over months. And we see the uh, more of the blue part is uh, falling in the uh, June and July uh, side of the months, which is the summer months, higher temperature. And on the right, uh, right plot, we have the uh, inverted U curve, which tells us like, uh, uh, again, how uh, uh, 
uh, the rate of crime uh, uh, typically uh, uh, increases at a uh, uh, increases uh, at different level of pace for all three of these type of crimes uh, in the summer months as compared to the winter months uh, next yeah uh, so uh, uh, now uh, on this uh, left plot we uh, look at the composite uh, uh, score uh, that is made up of uh, all three type of crime that we looked at which is indexed uh, non -ind uh, property and non indexed uh, uh, which is non indexed property and violent crime uh, uh, and uh, uh, this is a heat map so uh, we can see that uh, the downturn area is uh, very high on this heat map and uh, it's a, it's a kind of uh, our uh, uh, location of interest where we want to see the uh, how this census tract are uh, you know uh, uh, how this how the number of crimes is uh, going through uh, this census tract over the uh, like uh, our data which is uh, to, uh, what uh, twenty years. Uh, on the right side, we have a season-wide radial uh, chart which encapsulates like a crime rate per uh, uh, census tract. Uh, so uh, what we see as we look at the four seasons and we see which is the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, height uh, the bars that we see here are uh, individual census tracts and its height represent the number of crimes that happened uh, uh, at uh, that census tract uh, in that particular season. So we see lower uh, heighted uh, 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 lower height uh, bars in the fall uh, uh, fall seasons. But uh, these uh, uh, since uh, these uh, number of crimes in these specific census tracts do spike up in the summer summer season as we go from fall to summer, and there are some census tracts that we see have very large height, and uh, that is typically to show that not all census tracts are uh, uh, you know totally dependent on temperature and they do sustain a very high level of crime irrespective of which uh, season they fall in. Uh, next. Yeah. Uh, so finally, we did uh, emerging hotspot analysis to understand uh, like uh, if how this uh, uh, how the type of crime changes when we go from one area to uh, another area. And on the left, we see that uh, you know uh, the uh, downtown area is a very emerging hotspot for property crimes, whilst it's uh, kind of oscillating hotspot. So uh, there could be a notion of uh, temperature, uh, 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 temperature there, uh, as we saw in the first plot, that how crime spikes up during the uh, summer months. And uh, uh, but for the violent crime, uh, uh, we see that uh, the west and the south uh, south part are more of uh, emerging hotspots. Uh, again, they are also surrounded by the oscillating hot hotspots, uh, which we uh, uh, aim to uh, analyze with the perspective of temperature, uh, daily temperature. Uh, next, please. Yeah. Fi finally, uh, uh, we have lots of uh, 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 like. Uh, 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 work uh, uh, to understand that how this uh, temperature and crime uh, 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 like correlates with each other, and find uh, we uh, in our future where we want to understand that uh, if we can sp uh, predict uh, a specific type of crime at a specific rate in certain areas more than others, and we can aid uh, public policy to make a policy around that. Uh, next. Yeah, uh, that's uh, uh, my talk. Uh, I can take the, I think, the question and answer in chat. Uh, thank you so much for your time. All right. Thank you. That was great. Um, all right. We're going to move on to our next presenter, um, who is Yuri Kim, a lecturer in the Department of Geography at Indiana University Bloomington. They have a PhD in geography from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, their teaching and research interests include geographic information systems, remote sensing, and the applications to the physical and human environment. Yuri will be presenting Mapping Heat Vulnerability in Indiana. Take it away. Okay, thank you so much for introduction. And it, it is really nice to meet you, everybody, through Zoom. <laughs> so I want to start with uh, give my sincere credit to all students in my classroom. So this is part of the advanced GIS class in this semester. Uh, and this class is mixed with the senior level undergraduate students and graduate students, so not just mixed with grad, undergrad, but uh, everybody's major and background knowledge is so diverse. So students from not only geography, so geology, anthropology, 
history, informatics, and public policy. So it's a kind of uh, true diversity and collaborative works, everybody. So we are here to use GIS to analyze the mapping heat vulnerability in Indiana. Next, please. So why, why heat? So as we might know, so recent de decades, the heat wave, so we heard a lot problem with heat wave because of global warming. But so this heat wave, heat wave rel related issue is health and economic loss. So we need uh, some immediate action to alleviate the problem with heat. So our just uh, our the interest start with that. So we chose the first uh, the top eleven high populated counties in Indiana. So of course uh, our ambitious goal is that how about mapping the all across Indiana? But yes, the time and energy limitation. Just focus on first high populated counties. And one more emphasis is uh, environmental and social equity. So for that, uh, next slide. So uh, we start with brainstorming. So what I mean by brainstorming is first, uh, right, it is really quite emergent issue. So what kind of data we have to collect? So we started with the literature review out there and real life example. So for that, after that, uh, our discussion just give us physical environmental factor, of course, surface temperature matters and canopy cover because that's the one uh, gives the direct shade to the surface. Then what about imperviousness? So imperviousness is just observe heat and the sea state for really long if the heat wave covers the surface. So three environment vectors that we come, came up with. And the other one is as we um, focus is uh, equity. So demographic and socioeconomic vectors that we think of is race, ethnicity, age, probably seniors, so age above 65, income, housing, and education. So focus is, yeah, let's include minority groups for this uh, heat vulnerability index. So collect data. So for that brainstorming part, uh, so my job is of course as <laughs> organizing. And this is why I just wanna give my students the full my credit. So it's your job is collecting data from everywhere, <laughs> our source, our data sources. Mm, so mostly from census data and others. So it, it requires a lot of time and effort to collect that, but we made it. <laughs> so everybody says collect data and my job is provide a recipe or the lab instruction guide. So collect data and the other part that we spend a lot of time together is standardized data because the demography or other physical factors have their own data range and unit. So our big picture is overlay the all the factors make a one outcome. But in order to doing that, uh, some data has, uh, for example, the race is the population, the headcount, but the income is dollar. So the, the value itself that matters. So, so that's the part of the GIS data handling um, issue. So attribute, the data attribute. So end of a standardized data is so each variable range from zero to one. So later maps, so you, we all will see the range from zero to one, all kind of map and the final map as well. And the final steps, of course, yes. <laughs> so it generate the heat map, each county. Oh, then says a block rule. So we came up with first the finest scale as a census block, but that because the data, some data is not available, that final finest scale. So that's our compromise for real life. Uh, next. Okay. 
So the three physical factors are surface temperature, uh, the Kelvin is the unit. And uh, look at that. So one of the examples is Monroe County, mm -hmm. which is Indiana University located. It's quite hot, right? Yeah, it's a hot temperature there. And the tree canopy and impervious. So data from NLCD National Land Cover data set. But part of our discussion is maybe we probably need local specific data sources for that. Well, okay, so right now that's what we have. Next. Then that's just five examples of demography or socioeconomic factors. So senior and house occupancy and for the education level. So again, one more time, our focus is minority group. So no matter what, so minority education attainment in terms of education attainment, because uh, census provides quite detailed category in terms of the education. So our just consensus is okay. So what about the group without high school uh, diploma? Interestingly, so even though Monroe County is really highly educated county that we people expect, but there's some location that education level is, yeah, so lower than what we expected. So that's the interesting discussion part that we can find. And of course, ethnicity and median income. So combined all physical factors and socioeconomic factors. Next, please. So that's the one. So that's the whole map we created, key vulnerable index. So zooming in some locations, some, yeah, so counties adjacent each other, maybe some county shows uh, the, in terms of the color is pretty, yeah. It's just adjacent to each other. Yeah, I see some connection between these two county, but some location is so abrupt change, it looked like. And by the way, the, the lower big box zoom in location is Marion County, which is Indianapolis located. And nearby Marion County, so we just really describe in Indiana's perspective, there's wealthy county, so nearby. So we just, just everybody provide a heat vulnerability map and analyze more the relationship between these factors. So find out, next please. Like that, for example, so Marion County again, Indy located there. So a student who created this map found, yeah. So age 65 above senior, and Hispanic is the two, the two most significant factors that shows a strong relationship with heat vulnerability. Okay, so that's Marion County. And next, please. But what about Johnson County? So which is right below the in uh, right below the Marion County, Indianapolis County. Yeah, it shows a little different story. So housing, and African-American, the black community is the one shows the most significant uh, the demographic groups. So that's just a two example, but each county shows a different story. So our conclusion is next. Yeah. So, yeah, uh-huh. So that's really diverse pattern we can find each county, even though it's all Indiana. Mm, so, so after this work, we talked a lot about the limitations, uh, how to improve this heat vulnerable index. But this, our preliminary outcome can contribute to prioritizing the area for some plans to alleviate the heat vulnerable. Next, please. Oh, I think that's it. Yeah, that's the last slide. And thank you so much for listening.
All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Yuri. Um, we're going to jump right to the next presenter. Uh, let's see, we're up to uh, Ishita Eva, who is a PhD candidate in geography at The Ohio State University. She's working on a research as a research associate with Dr. Stephen Queering on a USDA project and has completed an MS at Auburn University, Alabama. Her research interests are in climate data analytics, GIS, remote sensing, and machine learning. Um, Ashita is presenting identifying the optimal approach for developing a one kilometer downscaled soil moisture product for CONUS. Take it away. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, I am Eva and thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. So I am going to present, uh, this is actually my doctoral dissertation. So I am going to present the overall, what I am doing for my PhD. So identifying the optimal approach for developing a one kilometer downscale soil moisture product for corners. Next, please. Next slide, yeah. So before diving into the method and all the conclusion, I want to, uh, want to discuss about why soil, why soil moisture. Like, what, what is the motivation? So soil moisture is a significant variable in the climate system because it regulates the land and atmosphere, water energy balances through soil evaporation and plant transpiration. Soil moisture is important for examining, monitoring, and in stream flow, hydrological parameters. And it is also important for flash flooding, drought forecasting, and weather climate forecast. Also, soil moisture is a small constraint in terms of the total available fresh water, which is 0.0015%, and total water in the global water cycle, which is 0.05%. It is considered one of the crucial parameters in the global climate system because it plays a significant role. Soil moisture controls several different processes in global hydrological cycles, such as runoff, infiltration, base flow, groundwater flow, percolation, uh, and also soil moisture also substantially influences the cycle of global carbon by controlling the soil carbon through the respiration process. In terms of agricultural production, soil moisture has an influence on crop yield, irrigation planning, disease outbreaks, pest control, and determining optimal management practices. It allows for irrigation to be applied before the crop is stressed. Soil moisture helps to balance the soil temperature and heat capacity, which also helps to increase crop production. When the soil is dry, photosynthesis, photosynthesis decreases and this reduces plant growth. Soil moisture helps to accumulate carbon in the soil. Phenology depends on the water quality in the soil. So due to insufficiency of water in the soil, ecosystem dysfunction is elevated in the forest. So based on this discussion, we can say the soil moisture is very important for different sectors. Next slide, please. Uh, while soil moisture is important for many purposes, national, national soil moisture products are not available with high resolution. Different products have different spatial resolutions, such as satellite soil moisture products are limited to 9 km spatial resolution, model derived products limited to 12.5 km. Therefore, often it is not uh, sufficient for field scale application in the agricultural sector. Moreover, these products are not really fast and easily accessible to anyone. Therefore, my project will address the critical need to enhance the accuracy and utility of national soil moisture products by integrating the available data sources such as in situ satellite and model data products and downscale with them to the finer scale such as 2 km, 1 km, 700 m, and 400 m. So, the purpose of this research is to incorporate new resources, new sources of soil moisture data, and to harness improved downscaling technique to generate more robust and accurate real-scale soil moisture estimates. Next slide, please. So uh, previous studies have shown that if we combine the multiple data sources, then our accuracy will be great. And this combination of multiple data sources is really essential. And there are some missing opportunities to develop models to assimilate multiple data sources. Most of the researchers that I have uh, found that they have either used model direct data or, or satellite direct data. But here in my project, I will assimilate these uh, three sources in situ, model, and satellite. And also the accuracy of the input data set is also essential, which was also missing in the previous studies. Next slide, please. So here is some of the gaps and the research questions that I will uh, try to address. So gaps are the national soil moisture products not available with high resolution that I have already mentioned. Also, there is 
consider there is also um, consideration of limited ancillary variables like the previous studies was limited to five or six ancillary variables but in my research i will incorporate at least minimum 14 variables that i will talk about later and these products are not fast and easily accessible and not sufficient for PLS lab application definitely and my research question will be which variables are the most important in terms of downscaling soil motion what will be the best approach for downscaling the soil motion i'll try to compare different approaches later on and as i am trying to downscale to multiple resolution i will try to find out which one is the best spatial resolution in terms of the accuracy like r square or rmac next slide please and my three objectives uh, is that first one is determine which variables have the influence it is these three objectives based on this three research question and the second objectives will be identify the appropriate machine learning uh, deep learning uh, methods and the third one will be which one is the best uh, spatial resolution two kilometer or one kilometer or 400 meter is the best uh, resolution will be uh, next slide here is uh, the representation of what i am going to do so if you see these independent variables i have like 14 variables precipitation api is antecedent precipitation index which i have calculated from precipitation and minimum maximum um, minimum, uh, mean temperature dew point temperature and dtr is daytime range which is the subtraction between max and minimum temperature and then land use ndvi is a normalized difference distribution index lai is a leaf area index, elevation slope aspect, slope aspect is calculated from elevation, and G circle is basically the soil texture data. And I have dependent variables, which is a SMAP uh, level three porex, and the native reservation is nine kilometer. And I have soil moisture in situ, which is the ground root data. And I, do, I will use this ground root data for the validation of validation evolution of the model. And here I will, and before doing the downscaling, if you're running the model, like machine learning and deep learning model, I have to come up with a common resolution as I have independent variables which have different spatial resolutions and soil moisture is nine kilometers so I have to do the resampling which is nearest neighbor technique and I have come up with a four kilometer resolution uh, which you can see aggregate and VS curve to corners create four kilometer then I have run the model and I, mm, then I have run the model and down is soil moisture to one, one kilometer and other 400 meter and before down is going as uh, the independent variables are this precipitation and all these variables so i have to do also resample this one kilometer because this is independent variables so model will take those variables as independent and then they will predict the soil moisture to one kilometer and then the last is coefficient correlation mean absolute error root mean square error unbiased root mean square deviation this will be the accuracy matrix so i'll calculate this um matrices to determine which is the best resolution and which is the best method next slide please and the random forest so i'll talk about a little bit about random forest why i am using so random forest is a robust and accurate algorithm because it can handle non-linear high dimensional and noisy data it can handle both categorical and continuous input features and it can be used for both classification and regression random forest can automatically handle missing data and random forest has a unique feature that it can provide estimates of variable importance and it is less prone to overfitting than other machine learning methods such as decision trees and um, svm is powerful uh, okay next slide please and svm is a powerful algorithm that can handle non-linear and also high dimensional data it can be used for classification regression both and it is less uh, prone again to um, other things and it is represent as two layer of uh, two layer of networks and it is powerful to approximate because to any training data and generalizes data on given data set an artificial neural network is also powerful and it is actually the relationship between input and output so it is crucial to determine optimal number of nodes and layers of, to hide in a model in order to maintain its complexity and a weight is assigned to neuron and the weight is of each neuron decides the function of the weights and each node of failure has an activation function and this function determines the output of the neuron. So, uh, yeah, so this is, there is a back propagation algorithm which is widely used to train the neural network. And it is the complexity of the relationship 
basically depends on the input and output and the output determines the number of hidden layer and the errors in the hidden layer. Next slide, please. So convolution is actually convolution activation and pooling. These three are the three parts are making up the basic structure of CNN and is a fully connected neural network. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the in-situ data. Uh, and uh, next slide. Uh, go to this map three level three data that I'm going to use. Next slide. So these are all the ins ancillary variables that I'm going to use. Next slide. Yeah. Next slide, please. And these are the final products that I'm. I'm just. These are the visual representations. So next slide. Yeah. So I'm just going to. Uh, so the next step will be the testing the ancillary variables to rank the importance and considering different machine learning approaches and different resolutions and make that data sets available through a website. So I think this is the last, last slide, right? Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. No problem. Thank you so much, Ashita. Um, yes, and just as a reminder, if anybody has questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A. And um, even if we don't have a chance to answer them live, we'll definitely make sure that our presenters uh, see those. Um, so we are going to move on to our next presenters. Um, we have a little bit of time buffer built in at the end of this session. So we may go over just a little bit, but um, uh, just to let everybody know, keep uh, hanging out. Um, okay, so let me introduce them. Our next presentation has two presenters. We have Stephen Appel, who is the Geospatial Information Librarian at the American Geographical Society Library at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee Libraries. And we have Ian Spangler, who is the Assistant Curator of Digital and Participatory Geography at the Leventhal Map and Education Center at Boston Public Library. And he is a PhD candidate in geography at the University of Kentucky. So they're going to be presenting, making open source georeferencing technology collections ready with the All Map platform. Um, all right, take it away. All right, thanks, Karen. Um, folks, uh, our talk uh, is about how to make digitized map collections more accessible, available, and exciting for map holding institutions as well as the people that they serve. Uh, we're excited to talk about All Maps today, which is an open source ecosystem for creating, curating, and sharing georeferenced maps. All Maps makes it really easy to interact with maps from all over the world, hence our slightly different title, uh, All the Maps, All the Time. Now, earlier this year, uh, we were awarded a Digital Humanities Advancement Grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to support the development of All Maps, as well as its inclusion in both of our home institutions over the next three years. Uh, we have a QR code on the top right of the screen um, on future slides that links out to an interest form if you want to learn more about All Maps. Uh, please take advantage of that, and we'll reach out to you. Next slide. Ian, I work at the Leventhal oh, Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library, uh, an independent nonprofit that stewards a collection of about a quarter million maps, 12,000 of which are digitized. At the American Geographical Society Library, or the AGSL, uh, we're a map library and geography, uh, geography special collection uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee Libraries. Uh, we have one of the largest collections of paper maps in the country and a uh, rapidly growing digital collection of scanned maps. Next slide. Uh, both of our institutions would like to enhance our digital map collections through georeferencing, uh, but there are challenges. So georeferencing in a desktop GIS can be difficult, especially at scale. Um, our institutions have both tried uh, vendor solutions that came with their own challenges like costs and access to generated data. Um, and without the resources of a large institution, smaller collections face barriers that can leave them behind. Uh, today's keynote speaker actually mentioned the need for better georeferencing tools for these collections and mentioned all maps as a potential solution. Uh, next slide. So all maps does, I think, really helpfully resolve many of the challenges associated with legacy georeferencing software. 
as a free, easy to use and open source georeferencing uh, ecosystem, uh, All Maps allows you to uh, share georeferenced maps uh, out of these networks. It's most simply a tool for georeferencing. You can start georeferencing in All Maps. Uh, just take a look at this uh, this animation on the right side of the screen at the click of a button from the Leventhal Center's digital collections. Once you are in the All Maps editor, <clears throat> you start by masking an image with a simple polygon. Uh, then creating control points by identifying locations that are the same on the scanned map uh, and the modern web map. And finally, opening the map in All Maps Viewer uh, instantly warps the map completely in the browser without creating any derivative image files, no TIFFs, no GeoTIFFs. Uh, all of this is happening on the client side. Next slide, please. A data structure called georeference annotations uh, is what makes this so easy. These annotations are simple JSON files or JavaScript object notation uh, that adhere to a standardized schema and contain all the information necessary to warp a map, uh, most importantly, the control points. When you start georeferencing in all maps, these annotations are automatically created. Uh, so compared to legacy software uh, for georeferencing, this is really quite lightweight and interoperable. Next slide, please. So at the AGSL, we really see georeferencing as a tool for discovery. Next slide, please. Uh, we use a platform called ContentDM to host our digital collections, including cartographic objects like maps. Uh, these collections use the IIIF protocol for digital images, including scan maps and atlases. Ian will give more details about IIIF. Uh, through this grant, we plan to develop tools to integrate all maps into our digital collections platform to allow anyone to contribute georeferencing and view georeferenced maps. Uh, we see this as an important innovation in digital humanities scholarship, tools, and methods. Uh, we have all, also been developing services around the concept of collections as data, uh, allowing our collections to be available for researchers who want to use computational methods on cultural heritage collections. Next slide. Uh, we see the vast potential of using geographic linked data to improve our metadata and add geographic context to broader collections, such as photographs and archival documents. Uh, shown here are two examples of what we call discovery applications that use geographic context and GIS in the metadata to make discovering photographic and aerial photography collections more fun and more efficient. Next slide. Thanks. And I, I want to talk a little bit about how we at the Leventhal Center are using all maps to make new Atlascope layers. Uh, next slide, please. Atlascope is our sort of discovery tool at the, at the Leventhal Center for historic urban atlases. Uh, we developed this tool for exploring and annotating fully geotransformed urban atlas layers. Uh, Sanborn maps, for instance, are the most recognizable uh, of the greater Boston area. When we first created the tool before All Maps, we transformed all of these layers in QGIS, uh, which was a time intensive process that required uh, training uh, interns and staff on a rather clunky interface uh, in QGIS that required the creation of tons of derivative and duplicative data files. Next slide, please. This is, a, this is our workflow now, uh, which uses All Maps to create these new Atlas layers. All Maps begins with the IIIF protocol, uh, which is an image transfer protocol that's commonly used by many libraries across the world. Uh, All Maps leverages the existing infrastructure of map holding institutions uh, in order to access them straight from um, libraries' collections. All of the Leventhal Center's collections are IIIF compliant, so that allows us to link directly from a stable manifest uh, or a universal identifier uh, in our digital collections out to the All Maps editor. The All Maps ecosystem automatically creates a georeference annotation for each map. Um, and after an atlas is fully georeferenced, we run a little Python script that uh, downloads all the images and georeference annotations, warps them from the command line, uh, and ultimately uh, we pipe that into cloud storage that serves these layers as XYZ tiles, uh, which are what go into Atlas Scope. Next slide, please. In the future, we want to streamline this workflow even more by eliminating all of that post-processing and trading XYZ tiles uh, for an All Maps plugin for open layers, which is a widely used web mapping uh, software library that we use to, to build Atlascope. Uh, <clears throat> this is not some radical dream, I want to emphasize, but a lot of these feature, uh, features already exist. 
within the next couple of years, all maps will make it possible to fully serve hundreds of georectified uh, atlases entirely through georeference annotations. Next slide, please. Are there digitized map collections at your institution that you want to be more accessible? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we're seeking to create what we're calling the Consortium for Public Geography, a robust network of map holding institutions who are interested in working together to sustain public facing, open source and free to use digital tools for creating, sharing and using geo-referenced maps and hopefully more down the road. Uh, consortiums make sense, right? They reduce duplication of effort and help level the playing field. Look at this consortium today, the Big Ten Academic Alliance. Uh, actually, many of the members are already using IIIF for digital map collections. Uh, can you click next slide, please? Uh, talk to your map librarians and digital collections folks on your campuses about all maps or getting involved with the Consortium for Public Geography. Ultimately, we see this consortium as the product of the grant and all maps as the process. Next slide. As we mentioned before, the Leventhal Center alongside AGSL is starting to implement these features in our own digital collections portals, uh, but we want them to be available to you in your collection. So please feel free to scan the QR code, which will link straight out to a, an interest form uh, that gives uh, us uh, a note to reach out to you about all maps. Um, I want to thank you all for listening, and we look forward to talking to you more about what all maps uh, and this georeferencing tool can do for you and your students and your research. Next slide, please. Uh, we'll briefly, as we wrap up, just want to acknowledge everyone else on our team, uh, the development team, uh, both of our institutions, uh, team members, and institutional support we've gotten from the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as the IIIF Consortium. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks, everyone. Great. I want to thank all of our uh, Lightning Talk presenters for those fabulous and varied presentations. Uh, I'll just comment on the last one that it's kind of nice that uh, to see we've got a little bit of a theme emerging today with our keynote speech and with this and with one of our presentations later about different ways that um, we're able to bring historical, scanned historical maps um, into uh, easier uh, ways that researchers can use them these days with more GIS and machine learning techniques. Um, so yeah, if anybody has questions, put them in the Q and A. Um, and again, if you uh, don't get them in right away, we'll definitely forward them over to the presenters later on. Um, 